All right, uh, it's two or two now. I think we can get started. Uh, so, hello everyone. Welcome to ASIC seminar series. Um, I'm John, um, the seminar moderator, and I will be moderating uh, this seminar together with um, Kathy Medley. Uh, Kathy is our um, communication specialist. Uh, so, this seminar uh, is being uh, recorded, and we will publish the video recording on our YouTube channel. Um, usually it will take a week or so, um, so please um, feel free to check it out later. Um, and today, um, our associate director and director um, are caught by in this Loa mini conference, so they can uh, attend this seminar. Um, and I will do the uh, introduction uh, about the speaker. Uh, so. Uh, professor uh, Noel um, Sernin is a professor in the Institute for Data System and Society and the Department of Earth and History and Planetary Science at MIT. She is also the director of MIT's Technology and Policy Program. Her research uses chemistry, chemistry modeling to inform decision making on sustainability changes, including air pollution, climate change, and hazardous substances such as uh, mercury and persistent organic pollutants. Her wor work also examines interactions between science and policy in international environment negotiations and develops system approaches to address sustainability challenges. She co-chairs the uh, MIT Climate Nucleus, the faculty committee charged with managing and implementing uh, MIT's climate plan. She is a recipient of um, national um, awards, including the US National Science Foundation Career Award, a member of the Global Young Academy, and American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, National Leadership Institute Fellow and a best feature senior fellow at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, she received her PhD um, in Earth and Planetary Science from Harvard University. Uh, so today we are going to hear about um, the air pollution, climate and sustainability modeling to support decision making. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand this over to um, Professor Serling. So Professor, please um, proceed. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me and, and see my slides. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation uh, to talk with you. I understand this is a, a fairly broad audience, but there are I do see a bunch of specialists in, in, in air pollution and climate here as well that I know. Uh, so hopefully this will put some of the detailed work um, that my group does looking at um, air pollution and climate and interactions in the context of Earth systems in a broader perspective. Um, and my goal really here is to, is to present how, how modeling and modeling-based techniques um, and advances in modeling and data can address some of the major sustainability challenges of our time by really better understanding the interactions of, of the Earth system. Uh, so I've titled my slide, uh, my talk here, Air Pollution, Climate, and Sustainability Modeling to Support Decision-Making. And uh, I thought I'd first talk a little bit about uh, sort of what do I model? Um, what's the problem that my research addresses? It's it's really a big one, and it's it's kind of why most most of us are here. Um, and in this image, we really live on a human dominated planet. And the Earth from space image really tells us that you know we're looking at a system that's increasingly societal, technological, and also this is a system that's characterized by nonlinearities, feedbacks, and thresholds. Um, it, much of the behavior of the earth is determined by interactions between how humans operate on the earth and environmental processes. Um, and it's also the life support system that we all rely on. Uh, so understanding the earth, uh, I really view as both a, a prediction challenge, a, man a management challenge, and as well as an existential challenge. And the issues of climate and air pollution are a really substantively, substantively important example of how we think about Earth system processes um, in this era of a human dominated planet. So that's on, on the what do I model front, um, but then what decision making, the sort of second part of my subtitle here. And uh, one effort to really crystallize uh, these kinds of goals of, of 
what the earth system life uh, support system is moving towards was the effort in 2015 by the UN General Assembly to identify 17 global goals for the year 2030, the sustainable development goals. And they, to my, uh, to my mind, are the best sort of global scale attempt to come to consensus on what kind of future the people of the world collectively want. And they really focus on what can be done to make people's lives better today in the future. So the challenge that, that I really see as the, the bigger overarching mod, uh, challenge in my research is how can we use these modeling and data tools to support decision-making towards sustainability, uh, towards better human well-being now and in the future? And the challenge of air pollution and climate is really an important area as well as a, a, a test bed uh, to really think about these interactions in a more um, concrete way. And one of the major air pollution challenges we face is, is particulate matter, PM 2.5, um, small, um, small particles in the atmosphere that are um, small enough to inhale and that lead to um, morbidities and mortalities globally. Um, these kinds of morbidities uh, and mortalities are from heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, lung cancer, uh, respiratory tract infections. And they're a major cause of, uh, of mortalities worldwide and of degraded environments. And at the same time, you know, so thinking about preventing these overarching health damages occur in context of ensuring access to energy because much of the sources of this pollution overlaps with provision of energy. And as well, the challenge of climate change, uh, because some of those energy sources, a lot of those energy sources are also sources of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So this is really a, a, an important test bed that links um, three of the major sustainable development goals, good health and well-being, affordable and clean energy, and climate action. And just as, a, um, as a, an example of the magnitude of this problem, uh, fossil fuel use, this was a, from a paper in, in, in PNAS several years ago, uh, about estimated about 3.6 million deaths worldwide annually as a result of emissions related to fossil fuel use. Um, so this is a pretty big issue. Um, overall, about 5 million avoidable deaths from human-caused air pollution uh, overall. And a potential area for understanding this complexity in a more structured way. Uh, so immediately, you, when looking at this picture, it's apparent that there are areas where there is a high number of deaths, there's areas where there's a relatively low number of deaths. So the heterogeneity of the system uh, begins, to, begins to be obvious. And this poses um, challenges for data and modeling, uh, particularly in the context of climate change. And there's been much work recently in setting out an agenda for how modeling, including research, recent efforts in data science and computation, can start to contribute to sustainability challenges. Uh, this is a paper from uh, on the frontiers of climate modeling, which is really a schematic of how data and learning can better be integrated into simulation capacity for future climate. And there are many different efforts to do this. I'm gonna be talking about um, at the very end of my talk, some of our ongoing work in MIT. Uh, but the majority of these efforts focus on climate physical sciences, building on much experience, a lot of, uh, a lot of expertise uh, from the uh, University of Maryland and data assimilation, weather forecasting, and, and other kinds of techniques. Uh, I'm gonna pair this with a figure on the right though from a, from a National Academies report on next generation earth system science, uh, also drawing on a lot of the earth system science kinds of expertise um, that, are, that have been built at, at institutes like yours, but also drawing attention for the need for a sharper focus on social and environmental systems. And in particular, modeling and analysis that can really help understand the full complexity of the earth as a, as a human dominated planet. Uh, so in the time I have, I'm gonna give some concrete examples of areas in air quality and climate that really help us understand that complexity. Um, so new methods and approaches derived from both data and computational techniques that I really hope can be further harnessed in other areas. Uh, so I'm hoping this will be generic enough for, the, for those who are not in the air quality and climate field to connections to their see connections to their own work, uh, but at the same time, uh, sort of give some give some really concrete in-depth examples of ways that um, we can move the needle on some of these decision making um, areas that will lead to improved human well-being, human health, and, um, and sustainability outcomes measures. Uh, so 
just to give a bit more focus before I before I dive into the details, um, these opportunities for, for progress can really help on two fronts, um, one of which is better understanding these complex coupled interactions that characterize specific systems um, and specific sectors and places such as energy and air quality. But ultimately, we want to think about developing and testing broader theories of, of nature and society systems. And, and part of this framing, um, and the reason I'm spending a bit of time on this framing is, draw, is drawing on an effort that I'm co-leading with uh, co-authors Amanda Jang at University of British Columbia and Bill Clark at Harvard, which is really an effort to build a community of scholars who are engaged in data models and simulations of, of different interacting systems for sustainability. Uh, so, so more on that, um, hopefully coming out soon. Um, in the meantime, one of the key findings of, of this collaborative effort is that while this remains a substantial challenge, there's more than we thought out there to work from. Um, and there's many new perspectives from efforts to understand and manage sectors like air quality and climate, but also water, food, agriculture, and fisheries, and lots of lessons to be learned across different issues and different sectors. Uh, so one specific set of examples um, on how to move the needle, evaluate impacts, is to think about how to evaluate interventions towards sustainability. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, two examples of research in the air quality and climate space on how to think about how to evaluate policies and decisions in the full context of interacting human and environmental systems, and then ultimately uh, talk about what we learn from that to broader understand systemic structures and to influence efforts to promote inclusive well-being. Uh, so this really draws from the area of air pollution and climate because we know that interventions, climate policies, efforts to reduce greenhouse gases can benefit human health. And a major way they do so is because the sources that um, emit greenhouse gases, also emit nitrogen, dioxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide that form, for example, particulate matter in the atmosphere. And I'm going to focus on, on PM 2.5 here for, for the purposes of this talk. We have very similar results in the underlying papers for those of you who are, um, who are interested in air pollution on ozone. Uh, we have some interesting complex stories that I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to take offline. Uh, but a lot of the benefits of um, Climate action has to do with reducing particulate matter, atmospheric particles. And there's a recent nice um, review paper um, by Gallagher and Holloway in 2020 that talked about studies that monetized the impact of strictly the air pollution benefits from regional carbon policies um, and how they compare to the cost of the policies. And one of the core findings across this literature is that. Um, monetized benefits often exceed policy costs. Um, and this is a nice figure that highlights some of some of the work that was done in, in my group, in particular, this paper by Emil Demonchev and, and others. Um, Emil was a, um, a master's student in my group. And one thing that is clear is that there's a lot of variability in the dollars per ton CO2 um, that results in um, from that results from the quantification of air pollution impacts of, of reduction. So everything from, you know, even just under different scenarios that we looked at, you know, 100 to 200, um, there's a lot of variability. And that really sort of suggests that there's both space for understanding better what's going on, uh, but also, you know, this is this is a, paper, a figure from the underlying paper, there's also spatial variability and who benefits. Um, the aggregate number might be large, but targeting who is really seeing those impacts for something like air quality, which is um, a local and regional phenomenon, really matters. And it matters in some really systematic ways. Um, just another sort of introductory slide to think about from, from Chris Tessum's work uh, that talks about pollution inequity. And we know that air pollution has disparate impacts on different populations. And in the US, um, there's a disproportionate burden um, of air pollution on, in particular, Black and Hispanic populations. Uh, and, and this work was pretty neat because it talked about not only the exposure, but the underlying drivers of exposure. So it suggests that there's, there's something systemic about thinking about not only what's happening in the environment, but some of the processes of, of economics and um, and production of goods and services that matter in these problems. So for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on two specific examples that really link the energy system and understanding what's going on 
with the provision of energy and how that's spatially related in the in the United States with outcomes um, related to climate and air quality. I'm going to focus on on what happens in two situations where you have a zero carbon um, energy source. And in the one case um, of wind power um, that that gets deployed um, and means that there is less of a use, um, less of a, a demand for fossil fuel power. And in the, this case on the right, uh, nuclear power, which um, is getting phased out as nuclear plants age. Um, and what happens to energy demand when this when the zero carbon source is phased out in the context of either phase outs of, of coal or of growth of renewables. And in each case, really looking at the um, the systemic interactions, trying to understand what's really happening when those zero carbon transformations um, are happening, but also looking at the disparate impacts and trying to understand the, um, the ways in which impacts are falling on different populations in the United States. And uh, both of these, this work was led by uh, PhD students in my group, Ming Hao Chu, who graduated in 2021, who's now a postdoc at Stanford. Um, and Lisa Fries, who's about to graduate this spring, who's a PhD candidate in Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at, at MIT. All right, so I'll I'll jump right into the the concrete examples, um, so you can give us so I can give you a sense of how how my specific research fits into this this bigger picture. Um, and the question we were asking um, for the wind power example is, well, okay, so there's all this broader. Um, broader concepts of how going away from, um, from fossil fuels will lead to better air quality. A lot of forward-looking model analyses, but we do actually have some data here. And we have data because there was a good amount of wind power deployed in the U.S. Um, between 2011 and 2017. And as you generate more renewables, um, that, that fulfills electricity demand. And that means that you don't have to use fossil fuels to meet that demand. Those fossil fuels are sources of SO2 and, and NOx, which um, then those pollutants combine in the atmosphere to uh, produce particulate matter, PM2.5, and ozone. So the idea is to try to quantify how much, where, when, that renewable deployment actually resulted in changes in PM2.5 and ozone over the US and try to understand the, the dynamics by which this happened as a, as a potential guide for how we might think about deploying new renewables to maximize the benefits as we transition to, to a net zero future. Uh, so the first part of this involves data analysis. And it's really important as, as we thought about this to, to actually get to the individual unit level. So what's happening here is not an aggregate model analysis. It's saying, how did each individual fossil fuel power plant in the United States respond to a marginal increase in, in wind power? Uh, so what we did was we performed regressions at each electricity unit using how hourly emissions um, and power generation as a function of hourly wind power and different variables um, such as, as demand. And we're essentially solving for these beta terms, the marginal effects of wind power on unit level emissions. So what comes out of this equation is essentially the response of every single power plant, what it does when an additional unit of wind power comes up. And, and we do this for, each, for uh, several of the, the different electricity regions in the United States. So once we have that response, we can then think about how that scales up. And here's where we fuse data and modeling um, we use a chemical transport model to understand, now that we know the responses to wind power, we can use that uh, to think about the total amount of wind power to meet targets for renewable portfolio standards um, in the United States. And we get a projection of hourly SO2 and NOx. We can put that through a, a chemical transport model and simulate the geographic distribution of PM2.5 concentrations. So again, the methodological sort of um, fusion here is between the very detailed data and the model to get a better sense of, um, of distribution and interactions. Now, at the same time, we can then have that model and think about what would happen under different kinds of scenarios. Um, now that we know what happened, um, what the response is, we can then think about 
what might be better ways of doing that? And I'll talk you through some of some of that analysis. Um, but this is this is the first major major part of that um, that chain of of thinking is okay. What do we get when we say quantitatively what are the SO two and NOx emissions changes that were associated with wind in this period, 2011 to 2017, in the United States? And this is these are the um, the electricity regions that we examined here. Uh, and this first panel, panel A, shows uh, the electricity generation, and you see that's negative. Um, fossil fuel plants, colored here in gray and yellow for coal, um, green for natural gas, and, and blue is blue as other. Um, they generated slightly less electricity when um, wind power was available. That makes sense. Um, but the different regions compensated differently. So, for example, in the in the Northeast, which is this third column here, um, most of that came from natural gas generated plants. That's just a function of what our electricity mix is in the in the Northeast. Um, but if you look in the in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland region, um, as you probably all know, being in that region, um, there's a lot of coal um, that is supplying electricity there more so than than we have in the Northeast, um, at least in the in the 2010s. So that, that wind power displaced coal. And you can see that the impacts, the differential impacts on emissions that that leads to um, in the Northeast, you don't see uh, much of a change in, in sulfur dioxide, but in PJM, you see quite a bit of decrease. And again, this varies across the different, the different regions. So the main story is here, we are seeing from the data that fossil fuel plants compensate for wind availability um, by producing less electricity and emitting less, but those generation and emission changes vary pretty dramatically by region and specific plants. So the, the uh, panels on the right here show the plant by plant results, just um, emphasizing that we do have um, that variability in there in the underlying model. Um, that's in, in the underlying data. And as we put that into the atmospheric model, we then, um, can calculate the impacts of wind deployment by scaling that up on PM 2.5. And these are decreases relative to what it would have been without uh, wind. And we see that there's a lot of avoided mortalities, um, a good bit in Texas, um, a lot of population in Texas, um, the largest PM 2.5 declines uh, in the Midwest US, but really a widespread um, benefit of deployment of wind power. But then we asked ourselves, okay, so we have now a nice quantification based on a fusion of data and model of what the potent, what the benefits were of deploying this wind power. But you know, this is a function of a system in which the individual fossil generators are responding basically based on economic factors. You know, what's what's cheapest to produce um, based on the electricity markets, and there's not much to say that. Well, you know, what happens if you actually made that decision differently? What happens if you were able to prioritize shutting down or turning down fossil fuel plants based on their damages or CO2 emissions, as opposed to just the economic decision making? And that kind of analysis really is what is enabled by this data and model fusion approach. And we did that. We asked ourselves the question. What if we could actually displace generation to maximize health benefit? And the patterns look very different, but the magnitude, the, uh, the patterns look very close, but the magnitudes are a lot, a lot greater. So you'll look at the, um, the annual PM 2.5, the declines in annual PM 2.5 are about 0.4 micrograms per cubic meter as opposed to 0.1. Um, and the mortality scale saturates here at, at 80 rather than rather than 30. So this suggests that there's a lot of potential for different kinds of interventions uh, that take into account the complexity of the energy system. Uh, so when we dive down into that and say, okay, so let's, let's see what that is once we add it all together. Uh, we can then look at, okay, so let's quantify the benefits. We can actually quantify the amount of benefits from, from PM 2.5, um, and from CO2 savings, we can look at the difference when we do this health 
dam damage minimizing scenario, and other ways of prioritizing um, which fossil fuel plants are turned down. So our total benefits of wind power in our in our base case, what we calculated is about um, just under five billion dollars. That's a that's a pretty big number um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, thinking about the uh, both the CO two the cost saving of the individual power plants, but also the benefits of, of PM 2.5 and you know, a, a quantification of the CO2 benefits um, based on social cost of carbon. But what we found is that had you been able to actually prioritize which power plants got turned down based on health damages, you could actually have a four times larger benefit from PM 2.5. Um, air quality wise. And the overall benefits is substantially larger as well. The, that might be hard because it takes into account which are the, which are the most damaging sources in the model. Um, but what if you just said, okay, let's just minimize SO2 emissions. You get pretty close to that sort of optimal um, health damaging minimizing scenario. Similarly, if you looked at NOx, and even if you just looked at CO2 minimizing, um, you're still doing better than you were if in the purely economics case. So you begin to get a sense of the potential for this system to think about who benefits and to what extent as we transition from you know, the carbon-based energy system to the net zero system. And along that way, there's a different um, achievement of benefits for different groups and at different times that is dependent on the configuration of the system, but also is something that decision makers could feasibly um, think about altering, right? There's, there's a good amount of space here to think about um, in both improving benefits and also potentially on the distribution of benefits. And on that distribution question, um, we actually looked into that and we found that actually there was relatively less of a um, less of a space to maneuver in there, uh, which partly this is a function of the fact that PM 2.5 is a regional pollutant. Uh, what this shows on the left is that sort of relative PM 2.5 benefits relative to the national mean. So in our scenario, this the first is the ex post scenario. Uh, we're showing here just the health damaging minimizing and the CO2 minimizing scenario. And the relative benefits by people who are in high PM 2.5, so already highly exposed populations, uh, the relative benefits people in low income populations, um, and different ethnic groups in the United States, um, Black and Hispanic populations, which, as I said earlier, are disproportionately impacted um, by air pollution. Um, and we really found that those, while those health damage minimizing and CO2 minimizing scenarios um, actually had a lot of um, a lot of impact on overall benefits, they didn't really address disparities in air pollution um, very much at all. Um, pretty much all of the configurations of which power plants uh, turned down um, addressed, had the, had the same relative benefits on, on these different groups, uh, plus or minus. But what we did find was that at, once you drilled down to the state level, there was a lot of individual state variation. Um, and in some states, there were uh, relative PM benefits to um, benefits to minority groups, and some um, decreases in benefit relative to the mean for minority groups. So there was a there was a real big space there, state to state, but not a lot of um, of influence of our different prioritization scenarios uh, on disparities. So one of the things that that told us was that first of all, you know the um, the control lever on a regional pollutant is very regional, right? That there might be a lot of overall space to move in, but you might need much more targeted strategies uh, to address some really thorny air pollution disparities that um, that kind of keep going throughout the, the system. Uh, so, so again, this work really um, really tells us a lot about um, sort of how the energy system is operating with a con with interacting with air pollution and climate and gives us some uh, some insight into how to design strategies for the future uh, to think about, first of all, what's the feasible space of who can benefit from uh, 
CO2 reductions that have air pollution implications. And the second thing really is to think about um, sort of how, what those potential policies and interventions might be. Uh, so moving on to, to my second example, um, this sort of goes the other way. So you should be thinking about, okay, so if wind displaces fossil fuel generation and we're building more wind, then we're going down in, in fossil fuel generation. Uh, but nuclear kind of goes the other way. Um, you're getting rid of a zero CO2 source. And the question is how to compensate for that without making things worse. Um, and so in order to think about this in a, in a prospective way, we can then use a, a series of models to understand both the energy system in the United States. So this is a, a dispatch model called US EGO um, that was, um, takes into account hourly generation uh, for every power plant in the United States, their emissions intensity and control measures, um, along with um, electricity demand, and then put that into an air quality uh, chemistry model and then calculating health impacts out of that. Uh, so basically what we do is um, take this, this constrained hourly cost minimization, which is um, the basically the workflow of this model and impose nuclear shutdowns on that. Calculate, again, hourly emissions data for sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and CO2, and understand what happens. Um, and I'm going to show, again, results for PM 2.5 here. Uh, we do in our paper have, have results for ozone as well. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. There's that. So we look at a couple of scenarios of nuclear shutdown, uh, one of which is what happens if we just you know do something similar to um, some of the policy responses to past nuclear accidents and say, well, we're just gonna try to shut down as immediately as possible. Sort of a stress test of the system. What are the, um, the fundamental sort of modes of, of response that could be, um, could be excited there? Um, the, other, the other scenarios we looked at are what if nuclear is shut down and coal is shut down at the same time to try to give a sense of how um, how sort of this, this broader phase out of coal in the context of nuclear would affect the system. And then the third is, well, what if that's happening at the same time as an aggressive growth in renewables? So we use some, uh, some future, um, future projections and renewables to, um, to look at, again, this, um, this systemic behavior. And so this is uh, the results from, from the first part of that analysis, the um, sort of what happens with the generation from each of the power plants. Again, just drawing attention to the fact that we have that uh, detail at the, the level of individual power plants. Um, you do see shifts in energy generation to meet demand. In most places, we do meet demand, although that's, um, you know, there are some places where energy generation just won't meet demand, um, given that we look at a model of the current energy system. Uh, but what you see in the in the no nuclear base difference from the base case is that most um, most of that compensation is done by coal. Um, if it's a lower cost optimization process, if you don't have coal, you get natural gas, and if you have a lot more renewables, that's what kicks in in the energy system. So again, this is straightforward, but it tells us that this um, sort of plant by plant is is essentially the behavior that we're looking for. What's interesting is, is what happens then to emissions and air quality as a result of this. And here's where we start getting some, some surprises that tell us something about the underlying dynamics of the system. Um, the base, this is showing um, nitrogen oxide emissions, SO2 emissions, and CO2 emissions under each of the cases. The base case is kind of the, the present day, mid um, late 2010s uh, energy system. The no nuclear case, um, as I said, coal comes up there. So you get a lot of sulfur dioxide emissions, which are associated with coal. Um, and a large increase in CO2, um, of course, because you're replacing a new CO2 source with a, with a high CO2 source. When you phase out no nuclear and coal, this was, this was kind of a surprise to us. Um, SO2 emissions went down, down a bit, but NOx emissions went way up. And we looked at that and we said, oh, we must have done something wrong. Um, but then we looked again and we said, okay, so what plants are really kicking in here? And what's happening is that there's a, there's a good amount of stress on the energy system when you take out both nuclear and coal. And in, in a lot of places, um, you know, there's, a, there's a struggle to meet demand. 
Uh, and what's happening is a lot of the seldom used natural gas plants that aren't very well controlled kick in and they have very high NOx emissions. And this is a, a systemic um, sort of response, which as we thought about it, we said, well, well, maybe that's that's not a realistic response. But then we looked at recent examples of when the energy system has been stressed, such as um, you know, issues in the Texas energy grid. And we said, well, actually, we do see this kind of dynamic increasingly happening when there's not enough um, electricity generation to meet demand. Um, this sort of turning up of older, dirtier plants um, under these, these stressed energy system. Um, system scenarios. So this, this tells us about, about a dynamic and gives you something to watch and to think about um, if there's sort of a, a, a no nuclear and no coal phase out. It, it really identifies that these sort of natural, dirty-ish natural gas plants end up being an important, com important component of the energy system. And when you allow renewables to replace um, at the rate that's a fairly aggressive um, phase in, basically they're all they're doing is compensating for the magnitude of, of nuclear power. Uh, but what's interesting is not in the same places. Uh, so you do see some compensation from, uh, from fossil fuel generation, and it changes a little bit the distribution of, of who gets affected um, by pollution and, and impacts. So once we go through and, and see what happens um, to particulate matter, uh, we see a change in PM 2.5 between our new nuclear and the base case. And um, again, this is this is increases again because we're looking at phasing out of nuclear and compensation um, by fossil fuel plants. Um, and again, um, increased mortalities due to air pollution. Um, we also looked at um, at what happens in this is less so in the um, in the base case with renewables, but still a bit of, of increases in, um, in air pollution there. Um, again, because the renewables just about, but not quite cover for the, um, the reduced generation of um, the nuclear plants. So it's something to, to really keep in mind as, as these plants are, are retiring um, that you know, the planned and expected deployment of renewables um, basically mean that for both CO2 and for air quality, you're kind of um, using that to play catch up as opposed to um, thinking about making progress on addressing air quality issues. So a lot of the estimates of thinking about what, um, what the deployment capabilities are and what the benefits of those that future wind power, like we talked about in our last paper, there's this sort of big energy source that if it does go down very quickly, um, needs to be compensated from somewhere. And a lot of that deployment might actually in systemically be a compensation rather than an additional benefit. Uh, so it tries to really quantify that effect. We then dived into looking at um, the distributional impacts and we found that phasing out nuclear energy um, really led to increased in exposure, particularly with the um, even with the, um, particularly with the coal case, leads to increasing exposure and mortalities in nuclear adjacent counties, and particularly fell on Black African American people who had the greatest change in exposure overall. Um, and that's partially because um, both previous research has shown that both Black and white populations are disproportionately impacted by coal-based emissions. Um, so that's a that's something that that we expected, but we were able to quantify uh, through this study. Uh, so just trying to pull this all together, um, just giving one specific set of examples using, using models to evaluate the impact of specific interventions um, towards addressing climate change with the goal of sustainability, of, of making people's lives better, how to evaluate the impacts given full complexity, um, and sort of moving towards a broader understanding of, um, of human well-being. And so I'll give a, a brief summary on how I think this sort of comes together as um, understanding some, some broader systemic structures, um, and then a few teasers of, of future methodological developments before opening it up to um, for questions. 
So as a summary, um, some of these, these interventions really are operating, and I think um, some of the energy system modeling really shows that, is the interventions are operating in the context of this existing infrastructure. Power plants are where they are. Um, the, there's a lot of momentum for deployment of renewables, but you know it's a it's a slower lever. Um, and these are operating in terms of the existing inequities as well. Um, and this is related to efforts to think about how to model and prepare for a transformational change. Uh, so it gives us some insight of where those those structures are and how they're operating when you're trying to influence this real world system. Um, and in both cases, it showed that our research showed there's much potential in the air quality and climate space for additional well-being benefits, even given these existing systemic structures, you know, a, a four times the impact on air quality. But there are important limitations to that, and and one of those is is the distributional impacts. Um, and the the idea that we could actually address this with um, with new models and methods that dive down to the very specific individual plant level um, in contrast with previous work that was um, that a lot of the work that my group has done in the past thinking about large scale modeling um, without that that specific amount of detail. And one of the things that makes that possible is the um, we did this with a, a bunch of different um, different very highly resolved models, uh, but there's much potential for using reduced form approaches um, to better understand these, these systemic interactions. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight two of those um, that come out of some of the work of my group. Um, one of which was a recent paper uh, led by Sebastian Easton as a research, principal research scientist at, at MIT, looking at how we can use response surface fits of high fidelity chemistry climate simulations to look to embed very fast but location specific air quality calculations that can be used, uh, for example, in integrated assessment models. So again, you know, the two papers I showed, a lot of computational time, a lot of detail. How do we then think about moving that um, to a space where we can explore different aspects of the system in a, in a quick and efficient way? And a second uh, project that I wanna highlight is um, the idea of reduced co complexity modeling, uh, creating emulators to facilitate easier access to complex information that also features in a new project I'm co-leading at MIT that's part of MIT's Grand Challenges effort. Um, and it's one of five flagship projects that MIT has funded as part of its effort to address the challenge of climate change. And um, our effort is called Bringing Computation to the Climate Challenge. Um, and we're thinking about different ways to um, develop a new generation climate model and bring reduced form versions and efficient um, emulators of that model to stakeholders without the overhead of a full climate simulation. And this will hopefully also involve uh, air quality as well as a major uh, driver of human well-being. Um, so with that, I know I'm, I'm a little bit over time. I hope that I've managed to highlight that some of these techniques in, in modeling that use a broad variety of detailed data um, offer a lot of promise in understanding the challenges of climate and sustainability, in the particular case of, of air quality, uh, but also the potential for learning from these kinds of detailed models across different applications. Um, and the ultimate goal is really to inform action. Um, there's a lot of challenges ahead, but I think there are, we're at a really important time where there's a lot of new methods and approaches that can form the basis for some exciting work um, in the years to come. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop and take some questions. Thanks. Great, hey, thank you, Dr. Celine. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and raise your virtual hand. You can unmute yourself and then uh, we can start taking questions. Or if you don't have a microphone, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. So I see a, a one question in the chat from Russ Dickerson. Do you wanna sort of expand on that or? Oh. <laughs> Well, that was really more of a comment that uh, you're you're dead spot on when you talk about what happens when you stress the system. Well, they they yeah they turn on these what they call peaking units. And it was funny because we we sort of we thought about that and we said, oh wait a minute, of course this is happening. And then we went through this whole sort of um, you know thought process where we said, well, is this is this realistic? Would you know the regulations kind of come in and say, well, you can't really do that? And what we realized was, yeah, but later. <laughs> um, 
in a sense, there was this long sort of feedback loop of, okay, so yes, it would only, it would only come kind of come back and feedback when you had already emitted too much and gone over whatever um, thresholds you had, you had violated and then come back. So we said, you know, this is a really important thing to, to keep in mind and where and when it might happen. Um, and, and we had, have seen this in the very stressed systems when you have, um, you know, other things going on like extreme cold and extreme weather events. Um, but the fact that the nuclear signal had was large enough to sort of start start thinking about that in the context of, of declining coal was was kind of a realization that we came up with that we came to sort of in the middle of doing these analyses. Um, but yeah, it was a substantial impact. No, oh, that's a number of plants. Yeah. Well, let me make one comment and then I'll let somebody else ask a question. Then I have a hard question. Uh, if if there's a problem, if there's a brownout or a blackout hospitals are not going to turn off the electricity. They're going to turn on their diesel generators. Uh, they, they have to. And those diesel generators mostly are totally uncontrolled. Uh, so the, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And uh, I think some, uh, I have a question about the natural gas delivery system, but that's a hard one. So I'll let, I think there's another question. I'll, I'll let that go. Yeah, I think Ross raised his hand first. Okay, thanks. Uh, hopefully folks can hear me. Um, my question, uh, I, I liked your talk. It was very comprehensive and thank you so much. <laughs> Excuse me. My question is when you're looking at specific years, like about the middle third of your talk and you had that regression equation, do you also factor in weather? Uh, because uh, I don't know if you're aware, but our group has done an analysis of COVID and, and basically we find quite different results uh, with the impact of COVID on um, electricity generation. And in our case, we looked at C CO and CO2 and NOx with and without weather. Right, so, so some of this is going to be sort of already included and in two different ways. One of which is we actually take the sort of actual hourly generation. So we have, um, you know, seasonal impacts. Um, there are some correlations that we try to um, try to account for in the in the different specifications of the regression. Um, but we basically sort of have that try to capture that variability with the hourly weather generation uh, with the hourly generation. And then the weather impacts of um, of air quality also uh, captured by GSCAM. So uh, some of the the day to day impacts. So it's kind of captured in two places. Um, but I agree that we have a very specific sort of set of years. So the question is, you know, how does how does variability beyond our data set um, affect um, affect the um, the ultimate results? Um, yeah, when when you're in a moving system, it's hard to do that. Um, I think the bigger influence, though, is that you know this is taking into account the energy system as it as it existed in that period, and as there are changes in the energy system, I would affect I would expect that to be a bigger difference in signal than weather. Um, but again, could could go through and look at the at the coefficients that we um, that we came up with to really test that. Thanks. There was also a chat question around the same time as as Ross's um, from Zhang Lu. Air pollution can be heavily influenced by policies. How will policy changes affect climate predictions of air quality? What are the model uncertainties? Well, it's it, it's interesting to to sort of frame that question in this way. I think part of part of the reason that we sort of looked at um, at the um, cases that we did was that a lot of the um, sort of air pollution specific policies and the the longer term policies. Um, you know, a lot of this work was done as as a part of um, the MIT Harvard Air Qual Air Climate Energy Center, uh, funded by EPA. And this was a sort of framing of the question in focusing on some of the climate policies as potentially a way to address air quality at the same time. And you know, thinking about the intersection with between those policies is is really some of the um, 
the reduced form modeling work that we're trying to advance. Because one of the things that was a conclusion from, from a lot of this work um, was to say, you know, the, the impact of climate policy on air quality wasn't just a complete free ride, right? There, there's a lot of space there to um, get better outcomes, but climate policy also wasn't going to completely solve your, your air pollution problems. Again, that isn't, isn't news to anyone in the air pollution community, but really understanding the interactions between those two types of policies. Again, the example of the, the peaker plants is, is one of those, right, um, where you have this intersection and under, trying to understand that better. Um, how policy changes affect uh, climate predictions of air quality. I think this, this highlights um, some of the other work of, of Ming Hao Chu, um, which looked at how can you understand in the context of different um, weather variability and meteorological variability, how do you do that causal attribution better? Um, and Ming Hao has some, some really nice work that, that he's come up with to, to use some machine learning algorithms to better understand the impact of policy, which um, which I think is is really sort of um, trying to push the envelope of understanding which of the policies are really operative here and how do we evaluate and um, and and understand some of the um, some of the driving factors in a more rigorous way. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Well, I have. If, I mean, I'm like the student should be invited to ask questions, but if they don't, I have a really tough one. I think it's tough. Well, if any students want to ask questions, they can definitely raise their hand. But in the interim, I think I can go ahead with that tough question, Russ. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of discussion um, in Maryland and other states about new buildings. And <clears throat> should we forbid new buildings to have natural gas hookups for heating and cooking. Um, that puts additional strain on the electrical grid. It's also the question is, you know, are, can the electrical grid handle it? And um, in the meantime, we, we need to fix the existing natural gas delivery system. It leaks. And so that means they, they need money. So the question is then, if you spend a couple of billion dollars, even in a medium-sized state like Maryland, on fixing the natural gas delivery system, are those stranded assets? Yes. So right. can, can you model? Yeah. You know, can you, can your model help us address those rather thorny issues? So I think I think some of the results from the nuclear case that I that I didn't actually um, sort of highlight were are really important in that context. And thinking about the short term versus the longer term um, impacts. So one of the um, one of the evaluations that that Lisa did as part of this was uh, to really look at you have the quantification of short term mortalities, which is sort of what I what I focused on here. But you can also use some of the work that's done with CO two and associations of, of the mortality cost of carbon, different from the social cost of carbon, but you know the number of mortalities throughout the century that are um, that are caused by the additional unit of carbon that you're uh, emitting. And it's just a whole different ballpark. It's much bigger um, than some of these near-term air quality impacts. Now, now, the question is, how do you discount that, right? Um, how do you value the future impacts relative to the uh, near-term impacts? But it really showed that the, the climate impact was, um, was substantial. So, um, you know, thinking about understanding these two issues on sort of if not an equal footing, but be able to um, sort of quantify out what the shorter and longer term impacts are a little bit better, I think helps inform that decision, if not not make it, but inform it, right? To, to really understand what you're trading off when you're thinking about those, those near term issues. There's other things that you can do in the near term to mitigate the impact on, um, on the electrical grid and kind of knowing what those are. Um, again, cost money, um, but thinking about what that what that pathway looks like. Um, I think this kind of work can can start to to at least define the contours of that problem is is sort of what I can uh, what I can offer for for that one. Um, again, knowing that you have a pathway to net zero as a net zero goal, um, 
eventually have to get rid of that. And how do you then calculate what the early benefits are and what the whole trajectory of benefits um, over the lifetime of essentially the CO2 in the atmosphere? And then can you think about the impact of that methane, um, which again, obviously also um, has a climate impact. So I'd say that, you know, thinking about that on a, on a multiple time scale um, basis would be, would be useful. Um, for the, the fixing question, similarly, right? Um, you know, but you end up getting some infrastructure uh, feedback loops that say, <laughs> is it is it harder to um, to replace something once you've then fixed it, and what's the opportunity cost of that um, of that investment, right? But but again, I think thinking on time scales really helps in in that as well. Thank you. It's good. Any other questions before we wrap up today from students or other attendees? Give you another like 10 seconds, raise your hand. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Celine for giving us this great talk today. Um, that was super informative. To anyone who wants to review the talk, um, this will be on our YouTube channel. Um, hopefully by the end of the week, um, uh, our YouTube channel is SAQMZ. Um, if you have trouble finding that, you can refer to John's um, email seminar announcements or just email the two of us. Um, we will not have a seminar next week because it is spring break, but we will continue um, on the 27th of March with another seminar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. If anyone has follow-up questions, feel free to, um, to email me. Uh, Aquia says hi and regrets that she couldn't join. Say hi as well. And, and I'll say hi to the MIT, uh, MIT contingent too. Thanks. Bye.